So it's not just the religious right or however you would, would label it that that legislates morality. We actually we all actually all do that. And and this is a good thing to walk our kids through. And okay, let's think about the laws even outside of abortion, but think about laws about stealing and all these things. Yeah. There's morals underneath those. Welcome to the Maven Parent Podcast, where we love to cover non-controversial issues. And uh, we got a non-controversial issue for you today. Before we get to the issue, though, uh, I want to encourage you, if you find the, the podcast to be valuable and helpful, uh, please make sure you share it with other people. Uh, there are lots of different ways you can share that. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube version of the podcast, of course, you can subscribe, hit the like button, um, ring the bell, as they say, <laughs> so you get notifications. Uh, but also, if you are listening to this on a podcast platform, like let's say Apple uh, Podcasts, uh, would love for you guys to leave a review and reviews and ratings uh, on you know honest reviews that talk about how great this podcast is <laughs> are really good and helpful. So please um, get on and uh, and do that, and that just helps to give more exposure to the podcast, which then hopefully in turn helps to equip parents, Christian parents, to navigate a challenging world. So uh, so in fact, stop listening right now. Get <laughs> get on your you know whatever the Apple Podcasts or whatever you're watching or listening to this on and leave a comment. Say nice like, things about Brad. Say nice help things. Help him feel better. Help us build a massive platform <laughs> to reach the entire world. Um, yeah, no, that we, we, we'd appreciate that. And, and really just our, our passion, our heart here is really to help Christian parents and Christian families and grandparents and anyone who's trying to disciple young people mm -hmm. in a challenging culture. And last week we talked about a very difficult issue on some levels. Uh, <laughs> and we won't revisit that conversation. Because uh, we don't agree on it. Well, no, we agree. We, we agreed agree. to disagree? No, we didn't. We didn't end that way. <laughs> Honey, you need to go back and listen to last oh, week's my podcast. Uh, we could talk about this with our counselor if there's disagreement <laughs> here. Um, no, we said, hey, the moral logic is not complex. It's actually very simple. You got to answer one question. What is the unborn? Complications on this issue of abortion come when you're dealing with real human beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> human life gets messy. Yeah. And 49 years of it being legal in this country yeah. obviously means there's a lot of people in our own lives that have been affected by it. So yeah. in that way. And so we, we want to we wanted to deal with this issue thor thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we're kind of taking a second podcast to deal with it. We went through the logic of it last time, and now we want to deal with some of the objections and some of the things that people, Christians or non-Christians, mm -hmm. are saying in, in kind of objecting to a pro-life position. Yeah, and we wanted to do this part because, yeah, like you said, the last time we talked about how to talk about it with your kids how to walk them through moral argument, and then even at their ages, how to talk to them about it. So if you miss that one, go back. But this one, we wanted to talk about the objections that we all hear in the culture with people we talk about it with. Hopefully you're in conversation with people about it, whether it's on Facebook or at work or on an airplane or wherever we end up in conversation. You'll hear these common objections and so what we wanted to do was to say, how can we talk about the objections with our kids? Now, if your kids are old enough, these might be objections that they have, that they lob at you as a parent who is trying to make a pro-life argument. Or parents may be struggling with some of these objections themselves, yeah. maybe kind of convinced by some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, or even if they haven't, especially you know if they're at that junior high age, to give them an objection, okay, this is what the culture says, how would you respond? Well, this is one of the best ways, I think, to inoculate uh, ourselves and our kids against 
bad arguments mm-hmm. and false ideas is that not only do you present, hey, here's the argument for truth, but then what are the objections? And here's how the d- objections are defeated. Here's how the d- objections are illogical. And, uh, and so you fortify it by not just teaching them kind of the what and the why, but also how to respond to the, the questions and objections. And in doing that, you really help your kid with the how mm-hmm. of thinking, not yeah. just giving them here are the pat answers, but how do you actually think through this? Yeah, and this afternoon I showed um, our two of our kids the clip of President Biden talking about this topic of abortion, and he said that Roe v. Wade is consistent with many major religions. It's not in conflict. So I I wanted to talk to them about it, so I just said, oh, you guys, come here and watch this. And then I said, so... This, you know, this is what he says. We play the clip and I said, okay, so what do you guys think about that? And so it shows them we are not afraid to let them hear or listen ourselves to views that are different than ours. Mm, that's and, a good point. And so that, I think, yeah, ha- ha- walking through objections with them does so many good things. But yeah, it, I, I want our kids to hear about the objections they're going to face first from us. Mm -hmm. If we take these things to be false, then I want to give our kids exposure to false ideas before they ever leave my home so that they're ready for those things. So that then when they do hear it at college or in the workplace or with a friend or on some, you know, social media, uh, you know, app, they won't be taken by surprise. And that just seems to be a wiser strategy. Mm-hmm. And so this is the whole idea of, you know, don't isolate your kids, inoculate your kids from those false ideas. And that means some exposure, mm-hmm. exposure to those things. So when they get that exposure, they're going to hear lots of common arguments. And I think the first thing we want to do is give uh, everyone a tool that, and we mentioned Scott Klusendorf and his organization, Life Training Institute, just one of the premier uh, pro-life training organizations out there. I think uh, Scott is, I mean, he is the best debater, pro-life debater in the nation. He's done so much good work in equipping the church and Christians to really defend life with truth and logic and science. And he talks about a tactic to use in conversation. And this is not like a something to, you know, it's not a gotcha tactic. Sometimes some people, I don't know, they, the whole, the word tactic might communicate something that people aren't comfortable with. It's the idea that here's a tool to help people think clearly about abortion. And it's called trot out the toddler. And the idea is that when you're in a conversation, you're reasoning with someone on the issue of abortion, you're having a discussion and they give a justification for abortion. So they say something like, well, it really should be a woman's right to choose, uh, you know, to abort their child. Or, well, if a woman is struggling with her socioeconomic status, she just can't afford to have a child. And so therefore abortion should be something that's an option for her. What you do in those situations is you trot out the toddler, meaning you say, okay, let's take that same justification that you just gave for abortion and say, does that work with a toddler who's born, uh, that two-year-old, does that just same justification work for the unborn now with a toddler? So if I said, well, I, I want to kill my two-year-old because I'm just no longer in a position to afford him financially. Does that then give us justification to kill the two-year-old? And of course, the answer would be, well, no, you can't kill the two-year-old because you don't have uh, the financial resources. No, you can't uh, kill the two-year-old simply on the basis of a woman's right to choose. You don't get that choice, right? And what, what that tactic shows is that any, uh, many of the objections to abortion beg the question, which is the logical fallacy of assuming what needs to be proved. And here they're assuming that the unborn is not a human being. 
right? You have to assume the unborn is not a human being to give these justifications. They ignore that question and just assume it's the unborn's not a human being because we know that it's wrong to kill innocent human beings. Mm -hmm. And so if you assume the unborn's not a human being, well, then you can give this, this rationale. And trotting out the toddler helps people to see that that justification doesn't work in both situations. So what's going on? Well, you, you're assuming the answer to the primary question, what is the unborn? If the unborn is a human being, there is no justification for taking the life of that innocent human being. If the unborn is not a human being, then, hey, elective abortion doesn't need any justification. It's no different than like extracting a tooth or something like that. And we don't ask for moral justification for extracting our, you know, a tooth. <laughs> Uh, so this is the key question. And so that's a really uh, kind of a helpful, it's a helpful tool that really illustrates what's back to the primary question. What do we need to answer here? What's the unborn? Hmm. Okay, so moving to specific objections then. Yeah, so that was kind of dealing with, with a host of objections yeah, that you'll get. Which is good to have that when we don't know exactly what people would say or whatever, just to keep that framework, which goes back to the first podcast where we walked through the, the moral argument about the unborn being human being, and that can help lead conversations back to that main point of what is the unborn. Yeah. Okay, so specific objections that we'll hear in the culture and that we should bring up with our kids and talk through. So the first one we thought of was you can't legislate morality, that moral issues are outside of the law, that you can't legislate your religiously, well, your moral things, which are rooted in religion and, you know, that well, those sorts of things. That's typically who it's aimed at. Yes. It's the religious the people. The religious people. You can't mm -hmm. legislate your morality, which comes from your religion, which comes from the Bible or mm -hmm. these kinds of things. So that's typically who, you know, who the, 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 you know, they direct this objection at Christians. Religious people. Yeah. So... The if you're talking to your junior high or high schooler, I would say, so what do you what do you say to that? If people say, hey, you can't re legislate morality, what would you say to that? And and see what their answers are. Yeah, or play devil's advocate and go, hey, you know, on this whole issue of abortion, and everything that's going on right now, can can we as Christians legislate our morality? Is that are we allowed to do that? Doesn't that seem like we're imposing our morality on other people now? <laughs> and you can play devil's advocate a little mm -hmm. bit. And not make them squirm for too long, but enough no, to be them uncomfortable. Squirm, make, <laughs> them, make them very uncomfortable. So that then they realize, oh, oh I got it. Yeah, I need I have to, to know answer how to this. answer it. Okay. You're, you're too gracious, mom. <laughs> you're a nurturing, loving mom. I'm always like, torture them, but only for a little bit. <laughs> um, no. So, anyways, so back to. You can't legislate morality. So where I mean, where would we start with this? Well, we'd start with asking some questions. So the first question that pops into my mind is, well, what what do you think is behind every law that we have? Underneath that is a moral principle, a moral idea, a philosophy. Think of something as basic as like murder. Yeah. Murder, we outlaw murder. And and why do we do that? Well, because underneath that, we have some moral that says it's not good or right to kill an innocent human being, which is what murder is. Yeah, we have laws against uh, killing people. We have laws against stealing people's stuff. We have laws against defrauding people. Mm -hmm. I mean... We have, we have laws against slavery, we have laws, and what's what's behind a law that would outlaw slavery? Well, underneath that is a moral view that human beings have dignity and value no matter their race, ethnicity, yeah. where they're from, whether they're women or men, all, all these things. So underneath that is a moral. Therefore, it is morally wrong to enslave other people. Mm -hmm. So, so there, yeah, every... Law has a moral judgment that's behind it. Mm -hmm. So 
it turns out the only thing you can legislate is morality. <laughs> that every piece of legislation is a legislating of morality. And it's and, and when you have a law, that law is then imposed on the citizens. So every law is imposing somebody's view of morality. It's not a question of if morality is being legislated or whether we can do it. It's a question of whose morality. And that's where we want to have an open public square where people can debate and dialogue and knock persuade. around and persuade. Yeah, knock around the, these moral ideas, these competing moral claims. Not knock around people. Right, the claims. <laughs> knock um, people sometimes around. Sometimes you get so frustrated you want to <laughs> knock people around. No, I just wanted you to be clear that we're yeah. not advocating violence here. No, knock around <laughs> ideas, right? You want to be tough-minded with mm -hmm. ideas, tender with people. Right. And so we want to say, hey, let's let's sometimes got to fight this out a little bit in terms of the logic of it. Mm -hmm. And we want the best ideas to win, the true ideas to win. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not like one side is imposing their morality and the other side is not. There's no neutrality here. No one's in a neutral position. Everyone has a view that they take to be morally correct, and they want that to be legislated. Mm -hmm. And so that the, the, the whole enterprise of legislating morality is legitimate. All sides do it, and that's okay. What The, the real question is, what are the moral views that are being legislated? Right, so, so even you're saying the pro-abortion laws have a moral underneath it. That's right. Yeah, and they, they they would take uh, access to abortion to be a m moral good, mm -hmm. right? And so they want laws protecting this mm -hmm. this activity. So it's not just the religious right or however you would yeah. would label it that that legislates morality. We actually we all actually all do that, and and this is a good thing to walk our kids through. And okay, let's think about the laws even outside of abortion. But think about laws about stealing and all these things. Yeah. There's morals underneath those. Well, you brought up the issue of slavery, and I think that is a good one to um, because I think that is it. it it's so self evident. Yeah, and it, well, but it's part of the like the culture's conscious uh, mm -hmm. conscience right yeah. now. It's so uh, it's, it's such a. Uh, Kind of yeah, clear, self-evident mm -hmm. view. Like it's wrong to enslave yeah. um, blacks simply on the basis of their skin color, mm -hmm. right? And, and and of course that applies across the board. Anybody on the basis of their skin color, and no one really in their right mind is going to be advocating <laughs> for slavery, mm -hmm. right? And so we can say, well, wait a second. If your personal moral view is that slavery is wrong. Well then, wait a second, aren't you then legislating your moral views and then and imposing on the rest of us? We'd say, yeah, and that's legitimate, mm -hmm. right? You don't think just because I hold a personal view that slavery is immoral, that therefore now it's illegitimate to, mm -hmm. to enact that in law. No, so that what that demonstrates is, mm -hmm. There, there's moral principles principles behind all legislation. So it turns out everything, every every law is a legislation of somebody's morality. Yeah. Now what we've had for the last 49 years with Roe v. Wade is someone's morality legislated. And we would actually say it was actually moral evil that now has allowed the killing of 60 million innocent unborn children. And so what we're doing in Roe v. Wade, overturning Roe v. Wade, is we are now legislating moral good. And that's what we want to do. We want to legislate moral good. And some people say, well, the law doesn't change people's hearts. Well, in one sense, that's true in that uh, uh, simply having a law doesn't necessarily change the heart of someone, but it can do a couple of things. It, 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 um, it, it can change a heart. Uh, it, over time by informing the conscience. Mm -hmm. So when a law is given, it tells people, hey, this is wrong. So it's instructive. And so when laws are enacted, it will instruct the conscience of people, which is connected to their heart. And, and so I, I wouldn't 
t- completely agree with the statement that laws don't have an impact on someone's heart. Now we all we also know that it, the deep work that Christ needs to do uh, as we put our trust in Him. That's really the mm-hmm. you know the, the changing of a heart from the inside out. Mm-hmm. But law can inform the conscience and inform the heart on these things. Uh, yeah, actually, that reminds me of when we talk about discipline with our kids and shaping their heart. And yeah. so the laws, quote unquote, of our home, it doesn't change their hearts, you know, in a like immediate way. But the reason we teach them to share and teach them to be kind and teach them to say thank you is because we realize that those things help to form their conscience, like you're Over saying. Over time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Time. That's a great, uh, great parallel. You, do, do you say, well, hey, when you tell your kid, uh, oh, you need to apologize to your sister, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we say, well, they, they, they don't really mean it in their heart. Well, that's okay. You still have them go apologize to your, the, their sister who they wronged because it's the right thing to do. And mm-hmm. over time, we want to train the conscience mm-hmm. and train the heart. Yeah. So um, the second thing it does, though, is it deters immoral action. Mm-hmm. So we might say, well, look, if you have laws against uh, robbery, that's not going to change the bank robber's heart. Okay, maybe it, it, even if I granted that and said, yeah, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't mean I then therefore take the law off and say, well, I really want to change their hearts, so let's get rid of the law and 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 not make it illegal to rob banks. Of course not. No, you still want to have that law in place so that when it does happen, you can criminalize uh, or prosecute that behavior, that criminal behavior. And so, um, you know, it, so that deters immoral action. Mm-hmm. Law can deter immoral action and keep un- injustice from happening. So look, I mean, gosh, go back to slavery as an example. You had slavery outlawed. Now, was everyone on board with it? Was everyone's heart in the right place? (laughs) Absolutely not. Just look at American history, right? (laughs) But we'd still say that was the right thing to do at that time. Mm -hmm. And it eventually, you know, did help form the conscience of the U.S. So I'm thinking about another objection underneath this, as you're saying this, how there's the objection that if we outlaw abortion, abortions will still happen. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the parallel of with murder. Or bank um, robbery. Bank robbery, these sorts of things. We wouldn't say, oh, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't outlaw um, robbery because people are still going to rob. There's still banks being robbed, even Mm -hmm. though it's law. Yeah, but we wouldn't, we would we would recognize in those situations like well yeah of course but we want to stop as much evil as possible yeah and we would want to stand for moral good in our laws and so we build our laws based on the good yeah this and is- even knowing people will still do the bad it 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 doesn't stop us from saying yes but this is the good yeah the, and the, this is where we would say it's so important to know the moral logic, right? The moral mm-hmm. justification. It's wrong to kill innocent human beings. It's ro- wrong to rob banks. It's what you know, whatever law it is. Mm-hmm. You say, well, people are going to do it anyway. Okay, yeah, they are, and then there should be appropriate punishment. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have the law, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so that's just a uh, it, it, that that's said in abortion, like, well, that, then they're going to go to back alleys, and then it's going to be unsafe. Well, again, that begs the question, unsafe to do what? Unsafe to take the life of a human, another human being. Well, if people, people, people might make that choice, that doesn't mean we change the laws because now they're going to uh, do something immoral in an unsafe way, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, mm. that's, a, that's another objection that you hear yeah. that doesn't overturn the justification against abortion. Yeah. So another objection that is just so common today, and I'm hearing it more and more and more. And this one you get from Christians. Yes. I hear this one from Christians a lot. Yeah. So it's this whole idea of basically we need to be pro-life from womb to tomb. Yeah. You got to be, if you're going to be pro-life, 
you have to be consistently pro-life. Which means, so their argument is that you you then have to, if you're going to advocate against the ending of the lives of the unborn, then you also have to do however many lists of things, depending on the person, I've heard all different things, um, you know, five, six, seven, eight, 20 other issues that you also have to... Care for the born folks. So mm-hmm. this could be health care. Right. You need to provide health care. Or it might be issues of immigration. Mm-hmm. Or it's, uh, well, are you have you adopted kids? Mm-hmm. You know, if you're pro-life, well, then you also need to adopt kids. Mm-hmm. And so there's like this list of all of these other policy positions well, that you have to have yes. to be consistent pro-life. And if it's womb to tomb, then I would assume then you'd have to also care for the senior citizens. I mean... All the way well, to the grave. That I mean, are you providing care for seniors? Are you? I mean, you could see how this could be. I mean, how, I could see the list going on and on and on. That's part of the problem with this critique. Yeah, it's and where's the, wh- where does that list end? Yeah, like what you know? How many moral issues or policy issues do you have to satisfy to be then considered consistently pro life? Mm-hmm. Right. So. So yeah, I mean, we, we've we talked about this with our kids and um, with each other a lot. But so where where would we start in, in this whole thing? Okay, you have to be pro-life, womb to tomb. Otherwise, if you're not going to take a stand on these other issues, then you, you shouldn't be taking a stand on the abortion issue. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, giving counter examples is a helpful way to get people to think through these kinds of things. So you might, what what you do is you adopt that same reasoning in some other example to help show how uh, this the reasoning fails. So for instance, let's say I'm surfing, right? I'm at the beach, I'm surfing with the kids and I see a kid drowning. And I go over and I help rescue the kid and I get him to the beach and I perform CPR on him and we, we, we you know, bring him back to life and we save his life, you know. And uh, but shortly thereafter, someone comes up to me and says, hey, uh, you know, if you really care about this kid and, you know, his, his life, well, you know what, there weren't enough lifeguards on the beach here, there's been a shortage of lifeguards. You need to be advocating for more lifeguards as well. And I, you know, I get that criticism. And then someone says, well, hey, you know what? Not only is the shortage of lifeguards an issue, but what about the poor kids? Poor kids, they don't have the kind of access to the beach as other kids. And so you need to, you know, that's an issue that you should care about if you really care about kids. Um, because you know, you save the life of this one kid and, but, but to be consistent, you also got to advocate for the poor kids who don't have access to the beach. And you know, what about education? If we had better education on swimming, uh, and how to swim and how to swim in the ocean, then things like this won't happen. But you're not doing any advocating (laughs) for the education of swimming. You know, go, wait a second. Uh, do I have to care about all of those issues to save the drowning, to be consistent in the saving the drowning child. Well, no. And we'd be like, that is, that's bizarre that you would get all this criticism <laughs> because you saved this kid, but you're not doing all these other things. And so that's a kind of a counterexample to say, okay, there's something wrong with this kind of reasoning here. Uh, I, w- I would say, look, th- number one, there's, there's a hierarchy of different kind of moral goods. And so we, we, one of the problems with this objection is it puts all of these issues, all of these moral issues or policy issues on the same level, mm-hmm. right? So helping a kid in poverty is on the same level with uh, murdering innocent children. Okay, now look, we'd say they're both serious issues, but isn't there a hierarchy of you know of rights and obligations and moral issues we would say it, it seems pretty self-evident that the, the the fundamental right to life is is foundational right this right to life is foundational if you don't have a right to life well then throw all the rights out the door 
We've got to protect that one first. And to murder innocent human beings is a, uh, a, a, a more significant issue than, than feeding you know, human beings. Now, again, it doesn't mean that that's not an important issue doesn't mean we don't care about it, but we're just saying in the hierarchy of things, there are some issues that are more uh, morally significant. Mm -hmm. And I think we all would acknowledge that in various ways. So for instance, this is why we have different degrees of punishment for different crimes. Mm -hmm. If I steal a candy bar from the local 7-Eleven, or if I slit the throat of my neighbor, there's gonna be a different degree of punishment why? Because one is more egregious than the other. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is one of the mistakes of this view is that it puts all these things on the same level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Abortion is intentionally killing innocent human beings. That's more egregious than, uh, the dealing with poverty. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean they're not both important, but one mm -hmm. is morally more, uh, uh, more egregious than the other. And so, so we, that, that's one thing we want to just note is like, hey, there are certain things that that it might actually be more important for more people in the culture to care about because it's so fundamental. Mm -hmm. And if we let that one go, it actually does have a uh, kind of an impact downstream on these other issues. Yeah. When you start chipping away at a culture's view of life, and so like the abortion issue does that. Um, well, then it actually affects these other issues on the quality of life kind mm -hmm. of issues. Yeah. So that would be one, I think, uh, well, let's see, a couple of things we've said now. Yeah. And I think there's more to say on this one, too. Well, it does, it does seem to me that it's only an argument I've seen used against pro-lifers. Like, you don't see people who are um, advocating for after-school programs for kids in poor communities. You don't see people saying to them, hey, you know what? There's a there's some other things that you ought to care about other than just the back to school or after school program. Mm -hmm. And it's like the person would say, it, this isn't the only thing I care about. It's just it's what I'm doing right yeah. now. It's the good that I'm trying to encourage, you know, yeah. and I just don't see it lobbed at anyone else except pro-lifers who are trying to stop the evil of abortion mm -hmm. And it strikes me too as so presumptive to say to somebody that you know is pro-life that, hey, you have to care about all these other issues too. Because I don't know much about anybody, you know, especially people online. This is, you'll see it online a lot. You, you'll see these, this lobbed at people who you have no idea what the person cares about or what in their private life Mm -hmm. they are advocating for. Yeah. For example, there are so many churches across the country that you've worked with, that we've worked with, that have all these ministries or have all these single moms that they help out, that they're, they, the church I got saved in, this little church in Anaheim had this teen mom program, and that's where I went and got saved. Now, these Churches aren't in the headlines, they're not, but these are Christian people who are pro-life and who are involved in other things. Do you get yeah. what I'm saying? Well, it's oftentimes just lobbed at people without even knowing yeah. what their whole lives consist of. Yeah, and you're almost, there's almost two issues here that I think you're addressing that maybe a, a distinction would be helpful for people to see is that the first one is, hey, this is typically lobbed at the pro-lifers and that, that issue is gonna go both ways though. So if you say to the pro-life advocate, well, hey, you don't care about all of these other issues. You've got to care just as much about these other policy issues and questions as you do about saving unborn children. Well, then that goes also that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and here's, here's a question that would help reveal whether or not this is a true legitimate objection that they're, they're holding to. But my question would be, okay, if I... Let's say I take action on all the issues you think I need to. So the first question actually might be, okay, what are the issues that I need to care about in order to be consistently pro-life? Like lay those out. And then when they give you that list, okay, this is the comprehensive list. 
you know, mm-hmm. and 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 then wh- why this list? Why not some other things? You know, but then but then say, okay, if I become active on all those issues that are on the on your list now, and agree to support all of those positions, will you then uh, join in opposing abortion? Right, because if you think I have to be uh, uh, to be consistent pro, uh, consistently pro life, I've got to join up with all these issues. Well, then can't I expect also that you are then going to, with the same fervor, join up with the pro life cause? I think that's the with the same fervor. Yeah, is I think probably the key because you see people say, "Yeah, I am pro life." Yeah, but but then it's you. It's the the question of the same fervor and the question of priority and all of those things I do think is revealing if you push back and ask them questions about yeah. what the the critique they're lobbying against you. Yeah, and what it does. So if they're not going to come that way as well, <laughs> then it's inconsistent. And But what it helps to reveal is that we don't have to check every policy box. We don't have to care about uh, or advocate, not necessarily, not, not care, that's not the right word, but advocate mm-hmm. and put as much effort into all of these policies as we do in our lobbying for the unborn mm-hmm. in order to recognize the humanity of unborn children, Right. Uh, and, and so this is a, dis, a distinct issue from these other issues. And we would say in the hierarchy of things, this is actually more important and significant. And it will affect those other issues. So I think just kind of this objection on its own, uh, on its own merits, it, it fails. Yeah. It's, it's not a strong objection. And then I think the, the other part you were getting at, Aaron, was this is a false narrative that you hear mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. That... It, it assumes that Christians aren't already doing mm-hmm. this and they're not caring about these things. But Christians are at the forefront of so much, like pregnancy centers. Crisis pregnancy centers. Adoption, yeah. foster care. Mm-hmm. There's so many Christians who are, who are because of their Christian worldview, because of their views of Scripture and what God commands, they're at the forefront of this stuff and they're doing all this stuff already and they're caring for the poor, even if they take a different route to do that Mm -hmm. and don't think the most effective way is through some government policy, Mm -hmm. but that it's more effective through private charities or nonprofits or whatever, or individual families. They they are doing this kind of work all the time. I I mean, I just hear, uh, we just heard from a pastor the other day uh, of the work that they're trying to do with refugees, Mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I hear that all the time. And I know of churches that are still involved in Haiti, Mm-hmm. Uh, from all the devastation from, gosh, I can't even remember how many years ago that is now, but they're still there working to to build and to help um, the Haitian people and, and, and are often doing it with little to no fanfare, <laughs> which is part of the Christian worldview. We don't go around trumpeting all the good social things that we're doing. Look at me, look at me, look at me. No, we go about quietly doing those things. Mm-hmm knowing that uh, our reward is in heaven for those things and it's not the recognition of man. So so we give in and we concede ground to these false narratives about the church and about Christians. Mm-hmm. Oh, you guys aren't consistent because you're not pro-life from womb to tomb. Actually, I think there's a really strong argument to be made that Christians are the most consistent because they care about issues in the womb and see that actually significant because it's the intentional killing of human beings. But they care about all these issues to the tomb as well from uh, issues of, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So it's just a false narrative. And sometimes we got to step back and and uh, not accept everything that the culture says about us. I, I'm just, I think we ought to develop a healthy skepticism about what, how the culture characterizes the church. Mm-hmm. Because a secular culture that is now negative in its view of Christianity is going to try to portray Christians and, and Christianity in as negative light as they possibly can. Yeah. Well, I just, just thinking about my own story and the crisis pregnancy center that I went to when I was 17 and they offered counsel, care, 
They did an ultrasound. They gave advice. They were a resource for a long time after that. And that's just not a part of the the mainstream media's view of Christians, but there are Christians all over the country, all over the world, who care for human life in all different ways. And yeah, I, I think just even just stepping back and remembering that is helpful when these things are lobbed against us, even by fellow Christians. And um, so I think having some of these stories is important because it does mm-hmm. it does show the the inconsistency and the wrong view that this really is about the church. Yeah, and that's a that, there's a real good practical step mm-hmm. to teach our families on this one. Yeah, get involved with the local pregnancy center. Yeah, uh, start a uh, a ministry to teen moms or to single moms through your church. And, and bring your kids into that and let them see you serving in those ways and let them get to see the stories out there mm-hmm. and and let them get to see how we in the church love uh, people in our communities. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the most powerful arguments. Mm-hmm. Well, there's going to be more uh, objections. I, I think one of the things I wanted to highlight in this episode is just some of the, the inconsistencies now that are explicit mm-hmm. in the objections to abortion, because those folks who are typically pro-abortion advocates, they're often uh, advocates for uh, trans identity, right? Transgenderism. And so you've got people claiming that trans women are women, right? That's the claim. And so I think there's an opportunity to help our kids uh, see that those ideas are false, they're inconsistent with other ideas that they're advocating for. If trans women are women, that means a biological male can be called a woman. Uh, what what does that say about protecting women's rights? Because then abortion is a women's right issue, right? And that's so, what the culture says. Yeah. That, yeah. That now what you're hearing with the, with kind of the outrage over abortion is oh you're you're, uh, uh, you know, you're taking away rights from women. Mm-hmm. Well, what right? Well, a right, and this is where questioning is helpful, a right to do with your own body what you, you know, want to do. Another way I think, too, we can talk to our kids and show them the beauty of what the church actually does do on this this pro-life issue is... is pointing out people in your own life, in your church, in your family. Because if you're like us, you know many, many Christians who are foster parents, adoptive parent. Mm. Adoption is a part of our family. It's a part of so many families. And even pointing out, see, like, look just in our community, in our family, in our church, whatever, and so-and-so adopted their little girl or so and so got pregnant before she was married and she went through this and the church came around her blah 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 and tell stories to your kids of the people around you that are consistently pro life that yeah. that live these ideas out as Christians we have these ideas about what human beings are and how valuable they are and narrate for your kids how that is going to look different in people's lives, but hold up to them heroes around you that they can emulate and say, see, this is because underneath what they're doing is a belief that human beings are valuable. We take care of grandma because underneath that, we know that all human beings are valuable no matter their age, their level of dependency, um, all of these things, degree of dependency, I think is it. Um, So we live this out and it's gonna look different, but really when you look at all that the church does, capital C church, it's really beautiful. And to help our kids see that. So then if someone says to them, oh, Christians are just against abortion, but they're not really for kids after birth, your kids would hear that and go, 
What do you mean? Like there's, I've there's seen so it with many, my own eyes. I've seen it with I, my own eyes. That's, I know that's crazy people. to say that. Yeah. 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 And that's where, and also teaching history, mm-hmm. you know, the same uh, view of human beings that animates us to advocate for the life of the unborn. Yeah. Those same views, uh, you know, per, are persuaded and motivated someone like William Wilberforce to try to end the slave trade in Great Britain, mm-hmm. you know? And so we have a rich history in the Christian church. Oh, yeah. And so it's, it's and, and look, what a powerful argument. Well, not only do we have logic and reason and science on our side on this, and we need to pass that knowledge on to our kids, but then ideas have consequences. Good ideas have great consequences mm-hmm. where we then take these ideas and we go back into the world and we do good things, and all of those ideas are then embodied in good lives that are lived out. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so that's the powerful testimony that we bring the truth together with lives well lived, and we are salt and light in the culture. Mm-hmm. Maven exists to help the next generation know truth, pursue goodness, and create beauty for the cause of Christ. To find out more, check out maventruth.com.